everyone and welcome to a very special episode of Trans Stupid where we take a look at the wonderful world of LGBTQIA++ news because, well, stupidity is intersectional. I absolutely love Christmas. It's a time for fun, friends, family and just watching Santa buddies on repeat. Yo, I don't sing, I rap. But it's also a good time for reflection to see how far we've come over the past year and wonder what we can look to on the horizon. And 2019 has certainly been interesting to say the least. Whether it's hulked out super trainers, outlandish NB icons or, well, this. 2019 has never had a dull moment. Hell, I've made a weekly series since February covering all the nonsense that's come out of the trans community and not once have I ran out of content. So uh, I think I've done quite well for myself, all things considered. So I want to say thank you to all of you who have put a talk in this intersection insanity. By taking a look back over the last year, from the hilarious to the strange, the milestone moments, and even some of the stories I might have missed along the way. So with that, pour yourself a glass of your favourite festive beverage, and let's review the year in Trans Stupid for 2019. January began this year in December, actually. You know, like, and I know it doesn't quite flow, but but stick with me here, as January's biggest story by far happened right at the end of 2018. So it kind of counts with this. Be fair on me. And that was when we were introduced to the trans community's most macho man. Excuse me, it's ma'am. It is ma'am. You need to settle down and mind your business, okay? Ma'am, once again, ma'am. I said both of you. No, you said sir. Once again, it's ma'am. I actually said both of you guys. General. Right beforehand, you fucking said sir. Sir? Okay. Motherfucker, take it outside. If you want to call me sir again, I will show you a fucking sir. I apologize. Motherfucker. I apologize now. Yeah, who can forget Tiffany Moore, macho mam Tranny Savage's frilly deranged outburst at a GameStop in New Mexico went viral right at the end of 2018, but the memes flowed on into the new year. Now, according to LGBTQ Nation, conservatives viciously mocked Moore. Now, let's be honest, you don't have to be on the right to find this cringy. Granted, I, I know I lean to the right, but this was a thoroughly embarrassing incident and it was absolutely not the right way to handle an accidental misgendering. But naturally, the trans activists were sympathetic to Moore's roid rage. Such brilliant anecdotes included, the trans woman in that video probably gets treated like shit in every part of her life. Back when I was dealing with intense trans misogyny from family, a roommate and my workplace at the same time, I was ready to go off on anybody who was even a little disrespectful. The video of that trans woman in GameStop is so heartbreaking. Nobody deserves to be treated like that. I'm sure nobody deserves to be treated like this either. Take it outside! If you want to call me sir again, I will show you a fucking sir! I apologize. Motherfucker! I apologize now. God, that video of the trans woman in GameStop is so sad. I want to hug her. I hope she's okay. And it was natural that these people would defend a baby tantrum. Of course they're going to. And we always see this kind of attitudes being protected as though it's justified anger. Hell, months after Moore's outburst, another Traner went at a similar freak out in a shop. I've been in the park a lot, ready to fight. You don't call me by my goddamn. They say you don't start the shit all over again. Do a goddamn sir walk around the motherfucker in the world with a goddamn titties. You wouldn't know if I was a sir if I wouldn't have told you I was a goddamn sir. A sir don't walk around nowhere with no goddamn titties and ass on their back or anybody who want to be associated with a goddamn sir. You should have asked me my motherfucking name. Fuck you and the horse that you rode on, you funky, sour smelling motherfucker. I was gonna leave you the fuck alone. Now I'm gonna call the goddamn scene, you son of a bitch. As a matter of fact, you gonna take these goddamn shoes back today because any goddamn girl who comes up in here but after me with titties and ass on her motherfucking back will be respected and she will not be called a goddamn sir. Fuck you and your mama, your sister, your brother, your uncle, and your cousin, you bitch ass nigga. Fuck you. Take these shoes. 
Now, Moore would eventually be interviewed to bring up her side of the story, saying that her strop brought out the bigots. Hilariously though, GameStop stood by their employee, saying, the incident that occurred between Tiffany Moore and our GameStop associate was unfortunate. We believe our associate acted professionally after misspeaking by apologizing and remaining calm to de-escalate the situation. The macho man memes eventually passed their sell-off date, but Moore did attempt one last shot at relevance by releasing a rap record. Yep. Y'all biggest and critics, I got a thing or two to say to you. So give this chick a minute, I'ma take the bike away from you. They got a thing to prove while millions of people talking shit. Watching tip the game, stop it straight off the shit. Intentionally misgendered once, you're gonna get corrected. Do it twice of disrespect, three times and I get aggressive. But the fourth to a sticker, you need a fifth or summon demons. And the bitch is fit to scream, so he can have fire breathing. Cause the yeah, that, that, that was pretty neat, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a lot of fun for the family. In February, a shocking story emerged of a mother being arrested in front of her young children by three police officers for the alleged crime of misgendering. Katie Scottow said she was held in a cell for seven hours after being questioned by police with no access to any sanitary products. The story spread with even Donald Trump Jr. sharing a Daily Mail article on what happened. Now, the victim of this horrific misgendering was a real lady lawyer by the name of Stephanie Hayden. Hayden first garnered infamy for reporting Father Ted creator Graham Lennon to the police back in 2018 after they had a fairly heated Twitter argument. Well, Scotto's arrest was the first of many antics that Hayden got up to in 2019. Notable highlights included demands that Mumsnet reveal the name of a particularly mean user and her one tran vendetta against Catholic journalist Caroline Farrow. Hayden alleged Farrow had an unnatural fixation on her and after exchanging multiple heated exchanges on Twitter, Hayden decided to consult her own Legion of Troon to discuss what should be done about that Farrow woman. Hayden came to the conclusion this would be best dealt with in court because what else would she do? And actually turned up to Farrow's own property to deliver the papers by hand as seen in this kind of menacing pic. Eventually a judge had to step in and stop the pair from mentioning each other online, which, let's be honest, is probably for the best. Shortly after, Hayden disappeared from the headlines, although it was revealed in September that Scotto would actually be charged with trolling Hayden. Still, she'd occasionally turn up on Russia Today, giving the impression that her voice rises every time she takes someone to court. It does not just relate to misgendering me as a male, it's far more serious than that. The allegations are far more serious. Um, I think it's very important that the two lived experiences are treated distinctly. March now, and the start of one of the year's biggest debates on trans issues, the involvement of trans women in sport. Martina Navratilova, one of the most successful tennis players of all time, kicked the angry Trana nest when she claimed trans women have an unfair advantage in sport. Cue lots of angry activists on social media and some organisations even cut ties with her. As a result, Navratilova apologised, although for the baying mob, that is never enough. But it wasn't long until more professional athletes joined in the fray, including Sharon Davies and Paula Radcliffe, and even people outside the sporting world got involved, with rapper Zuby showing how bizarre the argument had gotten by setting the women's weightlifting record because he decided to identify as a woman for enough time to pull it off. Truly stunning and brave. But is there much of a debate to be had about trans athletes? I mean, how much of an advantage could someone who is born male, had the best had the benefits of testosterone to build up their muscles, and competed professionally in many cases, really have? Well, what about JC Cooper, who was told she couldn't compete in women's weightlifting because of her gender identity? You know, just, just because she has a history with weightlifting and other sports prior to her transition, doesn't mean she has any kind of advantage. Also, she's apparently trans feminine rather than a trans woman, so there's, there's, there's that, I guess. Uh, oh, there's Cece Telfer, who once ranked 390th at men's 400m hurdles, only to become the champion once she transitioned. And then there's cricketer Maxine Blyvin, who was named Kent's Woman Player of the Year back in September, and gold medal winning weightlifter Laurel Hubbard, and the six foot two handball player Hannah Mouncey. 
or rugby player Kelly Morgan. I'm, I'm guessing that you kind of get the picture at this point. But wait, there's more. But there's no way that I can talk about trans athletes without mentioning the most infamous trainer of all. Rachel McKinnon, the record-breaking trans cyclist and all-around decent human being who claims that having a sexual preference that doesn't include her penis is immoral, and she even mocked the death of a young woman from brain cancer. Now, she's been regarded as one of the biggest advocates for trans women in sport, and I mean, she would be, considering she's broken several world records, but even outside of sport, she's regularly being held up as a true trans spokesperson, although apparently not influential enough to get people to come and see her talk. Now, I can't talk about trans in sport without commenting on the episode of South Park, which came out just a few months ago. It was one which I was hoping to cover at the time, but due to illness, I wasn't able to get around to it. Ultimately, I thought that was a fantastic episode and it really put forward a solid argument as to why there is a bit more to trans people in sport than just blanket acceptance. Now, South Park has actually progressed a lot on trans issues over the years, going from being a trans woman is equivalent to being a dolphin, all the way to a more sensitive look at saying you can respect people for being trans, but let's be sensible about this. Of course, it pissed off the baying mob because it always would. But I thought it was a fantastic episode. I wish I could have really done more of a review on it. And I do apologize that I didn't get around to it. Now, probably the most appropriate story for this list came out in April, and it's genuinely one of my favorites. So meet Chantal Saunders, who decided this picture would be a good look to go with her story. So already we know it's gonna be something special. Now, last Christmas, Chantal decided to visit the Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital to spread some Christmas cheer to her friend who was staying there at the time. But then, nurses at the hospital reportedly mistook her for a man, and when she complained about being misgendered, she was told they thought she was a man because she had a beard. Chantel disputed this by pointing out she was actually wearing an Anne Summers sexy Santa costume. Yeah, um, a, a 34 year old thought it would be a good idea to visit a public hospital wearing a costume from a sex shop and then decided to tell the world about it as a way of spreading awareness. Like, I particularly love how Chantel pointed out she's always had full makeup and had her hair on that day. Great, good for you. But not really commenting on the fact that you wore a sex shop to a hospital and, and did what, exactly? Just spreading Christmas cheer with your jolly presents? Like, Chantel's Sexy Santa, as hilarious as it is, is part of a trend of trans people bringing complaints of misgendering to the public eye, despite the bizarreness of their actions. Just look at Katie Yeomans, who demanded £2,500 from the Southern Rail for calling her a man, when she sounded like this. In 2014, a friend of mine invited me to a um, fancy dress party, and he said, well, why don't you dress up like a girl? Thankfully these stories are relatively few and far between and that's a good thing because they are incredibly cringy and show a bit of the more deranged side of the trans community. I understand that some people will have a hard time passing, um, whether it's through voice or general appearance, however when you draw attention to how long it is, maybe you also need to take a step back and think of why did you get misgendered in the first place? And why are you going to a hospital wearing an Anne Summers sexy Santa costume? Now, May was a month in which the LGBTQIA++ community was offended by a sandwich from Marks and Spencer, but it also introduced us to the world's laziest non-binary person. And that, of course, is Gregor Murray from the Scottish National Party, who ended up quitting the party over institutional transphobia. This is despite the fact that he was suspended for sending fairly abusive messages to other counsellors, accusing people of being turfs and saying look, quite a lot of nasty things. But just look at Murray. So Murray has made absolutely no effort to look anything other than a man and is claiming that it's difficult being the only 
non-binary, the only trans person in Scottish politics right now, when nobody would think that you're trans because you don't look in any way. Like, if you looked like, you know, one of the more flamboyant non-binary people, there might be at least a little bit of sympathy there because, yeah, you look different, you're presenting in a different way, but there's nothing radical about saying that your pronouns are they and that is literally the extent of your transness. Now, Murray wasn't the only no effort non-binary person to come out this year. In fact, he's probably one of the least prominent. I mean, this was a year when Sam Smith came out as being a they and hit headlines worldwide and received lots of praise and attention for being a brave trans person who is now a they without doing a single thing to change his appearance whatsoever. Like, there is nothing different about him. Maybe a little bit of glitter. Great, that's not a gender. This really highlighted just how lazy it can be to be NB sometimes. And the likes of Gregor Murray, there's going to be a lot more of them in the future. Just as a quick side note though, it isn't only males who get this lazy when they come out as MBs, there's plenty of women who are exactly the same, so I'm not targeting one particular sex, I'm just targeting a particularly stupid gender. You're entitled to your opinion. If but I am, then why would you kick me out of class? It's not very inclusive of Can opinion. Can I finish my sentence please? Not very inclusive? No, I'm sorry, what you were saying was not very inclusive, and this is an inclusive school. Yeah, what, how is what I was saying? Because I was saying that what, what's wrong with the website is that there are more than one gender in well, this country. That's by your opinion. That is my opinion, and that is an opinion which is acceptable in the school. I'm afraid yours, which you're saying that there's no such thing as anyone other than male or female, is Scientifically, not inclusive. Scientifically, there are just two genders. So the video you just saw took place in Aberdeenshire back in June, where a student was effectively thrown out of his class and suspended for a week for daring to question that more than two genders exist. Now what was particularly troubling about this is that this is the education system telling someone not to think critically over something which is a relatively new concept and one that has only been pushed in the public eye in the last year or two really i mean think about like five years ago would this school be enforcing the belief that there are multiple sexes and multiple genders i don't think so and it kind of shows the power of the trans lobby and it's particularly troubling when this is happening in education where you should be asking questions where you should be learning this is just enforcing an ideology on people, and according to Breitbart, the young student involved in this was actually expelled as a result, although that could have been for filming it and putting it online. The narrative, however, does not make the school look good one way or another. On the subject of education, I would just like to use this moment to point out that about a year and a half after NUS trans officer Jess Bradley was suspended amid serious allegations of sexual misconduct, there's still been absolutely nothing from the NUS. As I mentioned in a video a few months ago, the police do appear to be involved, but there is no other information on this, and the community as a whole have really stuck up for Bradders. It's interesting that these are the same people who are going to be pushing this multiple genders, multiple sexes narrative in schools that you can't question. And they are completely incapable of being held to account even within their own circles. So just watch out for that. So quite a bit happened in July, didn't it? And um, JK Rowling caused outrage after becoming a confirmed TERF. The trans community freaked out when an evil cis actress got a role playing a trans man and the non-binary community claimed the British government wasn't even allowing them to exist. But you don't care about any of that, do you? Let's face it, there is one thing that everyone knows happened in July and uh, hell, most of you know who I am precisely because of the elephant in the room. Fine, Jessica Yaniv. 
Yes, Yeniv and their homegrown brand of mayhem, also known as Yenivery, became the bulk of what people talked about when it came to trans issues for July and indeed the rest of the year, especially me. It was hard to look away from this Hindenburg disaster that befell the trans community, with Yenivery ranging from the stupid to the downright disturbing. Most of the attention went on Yeniv's misguided attempt to take 15 women to Canada's Human Rights Tribunal for refusing to give them a Brazilian wax, despite having male genitals. And yes, this was something which actually happened in current year. I, there was a case where someone had to decide whether a set of testicles could be considered female genitalia because the owner of said testicles self-identified as a woman. Yeah, hooray for current year. Like, even as a seasoned univologist, it still hurts my head when I have to actually say that sentence out loud. But of course, the ball waxing wasn't the only Yaniv controversy. In fact, what was probably more significant were the abusive messages that Yaniv was found to have sent to fairly young women and an obsession with periods and tampons that was beyond disturbed. But I think it's important to understand exactly why Yaniv went big at this point in time, because up until the end of July, when a certain video came out, most of the world was blissfully unaware of the Titanic Trana in Canada. Of course, there were people who were aware of what Yaniv was and the shenanigans they were getting up to, even in 2018, but reporting on the subject itself was difficult due to a combination of frustrating factors. Firstly, Yaniv was able to gain anonymity in the Canadian legal system after they filed the infamous ball waxing cases, which severely limited the amount of outlets that were able to cover the story with any degree of scrutiny, only referring to Yaniv as JY. But more importantly, Yaniv weaponized the reporting systems of various social media sites like Twitter, Facebook and YouTube to take down any criticism or disparaging comments aimed at them. Like famous examples of Yaniv abusing the system include Megan Murphy, a radical feminist blogger who found herself completely removed from Twitter permanently after referring to Yaniv as a man, despite Yaniv's online presence at the time using the name Jonathan. And there was a radical feminist WordPress site called Gender Trender, which was deleted outright just for talking about Yaniv. Now, this left people using prominent social media platforms like myself to talk around the subject, which became really infuriating for those of us who wanted to expose Yaniv for who they really were. For example, in my Pillars of the Community video on Yaniv, I had to use JY and blur all images to protect myself as much as possible, and thankfully the video stayed up. Of course, there were sites outside of Yaniv's control, such as Kiwi Farms, and a blog post by Mirandi Yardley, which hilariously for a time, was one of the first pages to pop up in Google when you typed in Yaniv's name. Now, the story only broke into the mainstream once Yaniv's anonymity was removed, news which was broke by the Twitter user Going Like Elsie, arguably one of the most important people in the Yaniv saga and certainly someone who deserves much more credit than she gets. If you don't follow her on Twitter already, please give her a follow. And then when the anonymity was lifted, uh, new stories started pouring in and videos were finally able to be made openly talking about Yaniv and who they actually are and using the name Yaniv. And my video on this went up less than an hour after probably the most important piece of Yaniv related media or at least Yaniv related criticism. So you may have seen this face all over Twitter and social media in the past week. This is trans activist Jessica Yaniv. Now this person is the walking, talking, living and breathing embodiment of what people fear when it comes to trans people. Now this person is one of the most twisted, abhorrent, dangerous individuals, is such a bad look for the trans community and transgender people in general. Blair White's video on Yaniv launched the period predator into worldwide infamy. Now everyone and their stout festive cat knew who Yaniv was, and like a tub of lard left on a radiator, Yaniv spilled out into August, where things really heated up. Now, on the 5th of August, I was actually due to have a live stream with Blair White to discuss being right-wing and trans. 
But when I woke up, I got a message from Blair saying that Yaniv had demanded a debate with her on that day and the exact same time that our stream was meant to go out. Now, naturally, this was a perfect time to catch Yaniv out, and so, of course, a particularly infamous live stream was born. And Blair, you know, what? I don't need to. Be, I don't need to be scared of my own house that I'm gonna get fucking attacked. I'm gonna get to the legal in Canada, descent. But do you think that was like cute? Was that a moment for you? Now Blair's live stream with Yaniv wasn't so much a debate, but more of a complete annihilation, which was to be expected after all. I mean, Yaniv cannot debate their way out of a paper bag, but pretty soon Yaniv found themselves in trouble with police for possession of an illegal weapon because of the taser that they decided to pull out, which that shouldn't surprise me that that actually happened. And some interesting news, that is now being pursued by Canada's legal system with a court date set for the middle of January. And if that wasn't enough of an angle for the Trubby Tranner, Yaniv's deranged escapades increased were against members of Canada's own media, at one point even openly assaulting someone with a metal crutch. Now, Yaniv also joined Kiwi Farms and posted a particularly nasty string of threats against one user, and even more allegations of predatory behaviour from young girls cemented Yaniv's reputation as a paedophile. Everyone loves their pussy. But if you can move past the Snorlax somehow, August did have some other notable moments as well. And one of them involved big name woke YouTuber Cat Black, who made an off-the-cut remark telling someone who had been struggling with suicidal thoughts to kill themselves. Now Cat apologised, although she used her own brand of black magic to make it all about her because she was the real victim in this after all and it seemed to work a lot of people moved on from the controversy but some other lefty trans youtubers weren't so lucky So everyone knows ContraPoint I mean she's probably the biggest trans youtuber on the whole platform probably bigger than Blair White in fact and her right on lefty credentials have earned her an incredibly loyal audience but as it always is with the radical wokists you can never really step too much of a foot out of place because if you do you will be cancelled and cancelled hard and ContraPoint learned this the hard way after she made a comment pretty much against this whole idea of asking for pronouns because it kind of works against what a trans woman is trying to do and it's something which I completely support her on but she was accused of erasing non-binary people believe it or not because of course everything is about non-binary people nowadays and she tried to apologize but it wasn't enough and she was chased off the platform because of course she was now she did eventually come back on only to then be chased off again after she invited Buck Angel to appear in one of her videos because he is also nasty true scum as well and you know you can't be fraternizing with the enemy after all. The ContraPoint story was particularly fascinating because she's held in such high regard and it's interesting that even the titans can fall. Um, whilst this might not necessarily have happened to Cat Black a month earlier, ContraPoint still felt it and I suppose that she still feels it to this day as she never returned to Twitter. October now and one of the biggest stories involves supposed trans child James Younger, also known as Luna. This hit headlines after the father was told by a judge not to really have a say in the transition, although this was eventually overturned. The story itself was one which was highly contentious on both sides, with people clearly having their loyalties to either the mother or the father and very few people actually speaking out against both or making fair arguments. Now, when I did a video on the subject, I did highlight that the father has issues. Now, I do also acknowledge that the mother involved has some bias herself. However, one video which I do want to recommend is one by Timber on Toast, which is certainly leans in favor of the mother, but in his defense, he does put up a good argument. So it's certainly a good counter narrative to a lot of what we are hearing about the story. But 
James Younger wasn't the only trans kid story, far from it. In fact, we've seen a lot with whole families in some cases coming out as trans and the trans child narrative is becoming bigger and bigger. We, uh, hell, even a few weeks ago, from the point of recording, there was a story in the UK about a 12 year old girl who was transitioning. Now, I find a lot of it kind of strange when you get kids that young who are transitioning and there seems to be very little going against it. In fact, when a children's book, which was written by Transgender Trends, was released and it was kind of more of a affirming your body book, it was considered as bad as terrorist propaganda by the woke activists, despite the fact that they have enough propaganda of their own put in schools. It is, this is something which is going to get bigger as the years go on. We are going to see more and more young people being labelled as trans. And bear in mind there have been concerns from various medical outlets that too many kids are going down this path. So the meltdown is coming, but exactly how long it will be until we come across it, that remains to be seen. November now and some of the stories involved really kind of involved gender critical feminism and censorship. You might remember that Megan Murphy, who I mentioned earlier, had had a talk organised in a Canadian library, only for it to be picketed by angry activists, some of them walking around with make, like a cardboard guillotine as though that was a good look. And at the end of November, we saw Posey Parker's interview with Trigonometry being removed by YouTube because of hate speech, as though it was spreading hate and it was encouraging violence, which really anyone who watched the video knows that that wasn't the case. It was concerning because there were real concerted efforts to shut down gender critical views and ultimately anyone who is critical of the trans ideology throughout the year. And in fact, I might as well use this moment to quickly talk about Maya Fawcett, who I'd mentioned in a previous video, having lost her job for expressing some gender critical views, has now had that basically defended by a judge as being the right thing to do. I think that this is something which is quite a worrying precedent and this is something we're going to see carry on into the new year. In fact, one of the reasons why I started talking about trans issues in the first place is because of the threat of free speech that the community seems to have. And when we see episodes like this, it certainly does limit the amount of people who can speak out against it. Time for December, and it almost kind of felt like a best of of the rest of the year, as Yaniv made a grand comeback by trying to say something about seeing a gynaecologist, and JK Rowling has been confirmed as a TERF again. And that's pretty much it for 2019. Um, there has been a lot which has gone on in the world of trans, from children to sports to Yaniv to education, to Yaniv, and Yaniv. And I kind of want to take this moment, because I don't have too much to say about December at this point, that I want, I want to talk a little bit about myself and the kind of year which I've had. So I started this year on about 1,000 subscribers, give or take, which at the time was much more than I ever thought that I would get. In fact, at the start of the year, I was very much focused on talking about the NUS and Jess Bradley, which, you know, it seems to has fallen off somewhat. And then in the middle of the year, my channel has just exploded and all of a sudden I'm now getting interviews with the likes of Trigonometry, Stephen Knight, Mythcon. Um, I'm making friends with people who I'm like, you know, I've always looked up to, like Blair White and Miss London, and I'm, I'm I actually, I can't, I'm almost speechless by, by how good this year has gone. I mean, I felt it would start off well because I had my facial feminization surgery, and you know, that was almost a year ago at this point. Like, I just look back at the way that I started this year and the way that I'm ending it. I'm immensely grateful for everyone who's been there for me, whether it's friends or family, or if you're a subscriber, if you're a content creator who I've collaborated with in any way. Um, I, I really want to thank you all so much um, for giving me one of the best years of my life. I'm, I want, I'm not going to be going anywhere anytime soon. I want to be doing this for years and I, I want to make the people who look up to me proud. Um, 
I, 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 <laughs> I'm genuinely speechless. I, I, I'm actually finding this quite hard to, to really string a proper sentence along together. Um, so this is a little bit rambly, I know, but thank you all. Uh, thank you all for watching in 2019. Thank you all for your support. Thank you all my Patreon and subscribe star supporters. Thank you to everyone who has sent me an email or followed me on social media or has bought some merch from my store or has just said a nice thing about me or has told people about my channel or, or you know just every little thing the fact that there's people doing all of this it, it means the world to me um so i'm going to be back in the new year there will be more trans stupid there will be more pillars of the community there will be more projects there will be more live streams there will be more rose of dawn in 2020 but until then Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you all next time.